now's the time to learn. <laughs> Show me it's okay. Hey, Ben. Good evening to those who are logging in. We are so appreciative of you joining us tonight. We will be starting in five minutes. Uh, if you're not on mute, if you can place yourselves on mute at this time, that'll be great. And please stand by. We'll be starting in five minutes. Welcome to those that are starting to log in. We appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. We'll be starting in another few minutes. So um, if you can place yourself on mute if you haven't done so already. But we should be starting in another few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us once again.
All right, everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining us once again, and welcome to our monthly series, Inspiring Ideas from Experts in the Field. This webinar series is in the third year for NOFA Mass, and it's our hope that we can make quality farming, organic farming, organic gardening, management education easily accessible to everyone, everywhere, at any time. My name is Anna Gilbert Muhammad, and I am the Food Access and Webinar Coordinator for NOFA Mass. My email is Anna at nofamass.org, and that's Anna at N-O-F-A-M-A-S-S dot O-R-G. Feel free to contact me with feedback about this webinar or any of the webinars, or with any food access or food justice questions and any of our work around the teen summit that will be taking place for the very first time at the summer conference this year. You can also uh, reach out to me via phone at 413-214-1237. Uh, before we start tonight, I would like to thank our sponsor, the Greenleaf Foundation, for supporting the production of this series. This series. They have been very generous with us. Also, I'd like to send out many thanks to all the NOFA Mass staff and board members who have helped to make this workshop possible and for the use of our new webinar portal. Also to thank all the current members that uh, volunteer or send support. If you are not a member of NOFA Mass, please consider joining us to support our education and policy work. You can go to our website at nofamass.org to learn more about becoming a member. You can contact me directly if you're interested, if you're not a member, as well as you can contact our membership coordinator. Tonight's presenter is Ben Falk from Whole Systems Design and the author of the book, The Resilient Farm and Homestead. And this is one of those must read books and a very easy read, I must say. The format of tonight's webinar will be a presentation with questions that can be posed throughout the conversation, throughout the presentation. And we really encourage everyone to send in those questions. So there are two ways that you can send questions to us. First, you can uh, use the question feature that's in this portal. You just type in the questions, I'll get a notification and we'll get that to our presenter as he's talking. Or you can text me live in a living color at 413-214-1237, and I will also pass those questions along. If you also want to indicate tonight if you are uh, viewing this with more than one person, if you're with a group of staff from a farm, uh, community garden, if it's yourself and a couple of people in your home, that would be great to hear where everyone is coming from. Uh, lastly, Again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to this wonderful presentation. If there are any technical issues that arise, feel free to also text me at 413-214-1237. And so at this point, we're going to go ahead and get things started. I will pass on to Ben. Uh, he is on the line now, ready to go. Ben, are you with us? I know you're on mute. You can unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And Great. now you can go ahead and pull your screen up, sir. Okay. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. All right. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, Let's see, play a uh, view. So this should, oh no, that's the wrong view here. Let's see. This should work. Um, can you see, can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, great. And so if I click through, it works great. So can I um, make this window disappear, the go to webinar window? You can make the uh, uh, make your picture larger. So it covers it up. Well, it's actually in front of my slideshow. So um, 
the, um, the window, the go to webinar window. For some reason, I can't. Um, I can't. Uh, you can make it smaller. Cursor. Let me see. You know what I'll do? I'll just scoot it all the way over to the side. Okay. There we go. Can you? Because you guys see the window, right? Well, now we we just see your um your slides. Okay, you don't see the go to webinar window. No, we don't. Oh, okay, great, because that's like blocking a good bit of my screen. So I thought maybe you're <laughs> looking at that too. Okay, so um, well, I'm just gonna go through um a bunch of slides of where I live and work, the two different sites that we we have been developing into homesteads and farms. Um. Please stop me with questions as we go. It's always a little weird just talking at the computer when you don't see or hear anyone um, and you just feel like there's you're talking to a black hole. So please uh, stop me with questions because it'll keep the, the flow going a lot better than um, just a, a, a silent monologue on my end. Um, so this is our original site. It's, we've had it about 16 years now. We've been on this property um, developing it into a you know, as much of a food productive and ecosystem improving landscape that we can. Um, permaculture is the approach. I'm sure you've, most of you may have heard of it. Um, it's just basically trying to cultivate the ecosystem to do what it does best while also getting a side yield. So it's quite different than most farming as we know it in that we're not just trying to get, you know, X, Y, and Z crops out of it and, you know, um, undo everything else that's going on there. Um, but we're trying to allow this place to continue its natural course of succession and adjust that as where we can um, to get food, medicine, fiber, material like firewood yields out of it while hopefully um, improving the biodiversity of the site, the amount of stormwater it absorbs, the amount of pollinator habitat um, it supports, et cetera, et cetera. You know, produces more um, biodiversity and biomass and, and purifies more water as each year goes on is the goal. Um, so I'll go through kind of how we've done that. And I think in general, that's been the case. The site is a lot more diverse than it is when we than it, when we got there. Um, it was a quite quite a degraded, beat up old hill farm. So in some ways, that's a good place to do this kind of work because it needs a lot of regeneration. But this is also the case in most places. I mean, most of Vermont was a sheep farm, not more than about 150 years ago, and it was all sheep grazed very heavily and badly. Um, so a lot of soil has been lost. So there's this kind of restoration, regeneration work to be done almost anywhere, and that's true across the world, unfortunately. Um, and we've also gotten a lot of food out of it as well. You know, one of the first permaculture principles is obtain a yield, get a yield. Because if you're just producing uh, regeneration and you're not producing food for yourselves, well, then you're asking someone else to make food for you somewhere else because you're probably still going to be eating. And chances are, you, if you don't know where that's being done or how that's being done, it's probably being done in a way that's less ethical and beneficial to all than you could do on your own piece of land. That's part of the idea anyway, um, that we, and we, we agree with that assessment. Um, so we're looking Northwest here. The site as a whole looks West and Northwest, very high water table, very shallow depth to bedrock. Bedrock is sticking out throughout the site. And then what the water table is at the surface on a, I'd say half of the site for half of the year. And it's within a foot of the surface for most of the year over, uh, a good bit of the site as well. There's only a few little dry areas and that's caused us to put our gardens in kind of all different random places. It's much more manageable to have like one garden zone, but we only have deep enough soil and are above the muck in certain spots. And so we've um, we've also made raised beds to help and grow on mounds as well uh, to help with that because we're very high water table, shallow bedrock, which is, you know, a challenging situation. Um, this is our studio office apartment here um, that we built. We we built kind of the barn and greenhouse and, and studio office, but there was a house, of somewhat of a conventional house on the property when we got there. Um, this is just partly I always want to show the place in different seasons so you can get a sense of it. And then I want people to drive this in part by a lot of questions, hopefully, because I don't want to just, I can talk about too long about different things, but I want to hear from each group. And I've got a lot of talks out on the internet, so I don't want to just repeat what I've said. I want to 
respond to what people are wanting to know right now. Uh, this was the existing house on the property, quite conventional, big lawnscape. And this is kind of one of the things we did one year was, was grow uh, in the yard, which we still do. This is interesting because I, this is a leach field where all this is being produced. And I realized there's only one of these crops worked. I mean, they all produced beneficial um, results, but the only, only one really made food for us. And that was the squash because the, the um, sunflowers just kept growing, growing, growing. There's too much nitrogen. Um, it's like you're constantly fertilizing a constantly in vegetative, not reproductive state. And same with the amaranth. But squash will go to flower and produce even if it's, you know, in a pile of manure, basically. <laughs> That's pretty much what it uh, was on the leach field. Um, but that was a neat experiment. I think growing in leach fields is a, is a huge need. I mean, it's the most fertile place on most anyone's property. Uh, if you have a leach field, you're not going to find a more uh, fertilized area than that. Um, so it's worth cropping at least for green manure and turning that into compost, which is what we do a lot of the time as well. Um, here's okay. some of our medicinal plant gardens looking southwest and the middle pond here on the right. Um, there's some beehives in the back. That's been a big last five years. I've been really focusing on those quite heavily. Um, you can see kind of food, medicine, pollinator, habitat, all all mixed together. I mean, it's all one thing here. It, they're they're not the lines are blurred. Um, here's looking the other way, kind of back towards where I just where the other photo is from. Um, see an oak here in the middle um we do a, we focus a lot on tree crops we have dozens of species of um fruits and nuts um that are ultimately hopefully will be the idea is that they'll be a big part of our food system i mean they're not a huge part of our calories right now but they are a very big addition um big supplement but down the road you know we want to be eating from perennial crops as much as possible um because they're um they don't require planting every year they don't require bare soil uh, even a no-till garden is is not quite the complex bio biodiverse ecosystem that a, a tree-based and shrub-based system can be i don't know that we'll ever get there in our lifetime in my lifetime but you know m the more of the piece of the pie that a uh, perennial food is um in our diet, the better we're doing. That's that's a pretty baseline metric. I think that's true for society as well. Um, the more we focus on annuals, the 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 less well we're doing. I grow veggies. I was just in my veggie garden half an hour ago, and it's constant work. <laughs> it produces a lot, but it's also, you know, they're weakling plants, and they they take a lot of coddling along and a lot of undoing of a complex ecosystem to make it happen. Um, so we. I love vegetables, but to put them in their in their context is important. Um, and grass, grass is a very good baseline for you know meats and milks essentially. Um, nothing's more resilient than grass. Even not even tree crops and shrub crops. You can't you can't beat the resilience of grass on a hay based system, to a large extent in this part of the world. Um, here's another, just kind of before after mm -hmm. shot. Um, Ben, can you take a few questions? I yes, do have I a few that have come in. Okay. So uh, as we're looking at wonderful shots of your site in different seasons, uh, how did you go about picking that site? And then the second part of that question is, uh, what's the recommendation for uh, folks who may want to start um, producing as you are? Uh, what's the best way to go about p picking a site? Well, yeah, that's a great question, and it's a very involved set of, of more questions to that and answers. Um, the, sh the easier part of that question is the beginning, and I, I basically picked this site because it was near an uh, architectural graduate program that I was go going to, and it started. Um, it wasn't really f too homestead. Um, I wouldn't have picked such a difficult site probably if that was the main goal. I was going to move there, go to grad school for architecture, maybe work on the place and then sell it versus just pay rent. Um, it was a place that I could improve the house a lot. And then I just started, I actually quit my graduate architecture program, went to landscape planning program down in Massachusetts, actually at Conway School. Instead, ended up basically getting work soon enough and renting 
to people enough that I could pay the mortgage and ended up planting and just staying there. But that really kind of was a little bit, um, you know, just as the stars would have it, wasn't the, the main idea. Um, I'm glad we're there and I love that place a, a, a lot. Um, but uh, because it's challenging and it's forced us to do a lot of creative things, we help people choose land all the time and evaluate land. And if you want to make it as easy a, a, on yourself as possible and not challenging, you know, you're taking into account a, a whole bunch of variables from, you know, microclimate, which varies by hundreds, you know, in hundreds of yards or, or even a mile across New England, you have a very cold marginal site in one spot and half a mile away, you can have a uh, much warmer, you know, really kinder, easier site. Same with soils, same with water access, same with vehicular access, like person access to the site. Slope, amount of slope, we, we think slope is an advantage to have some, like three to 12, 15% grade, but not more than 15% grades, just making things difficult, not easier. And if it's really flat, less than 3% grade, it's it tends to be pretty wet um, in New England, um, or it tends to be in the floodplain. So usually, if you're really low angle, you kind of have to watch out for both of those. Um, that's not true for all sites. If you find a 3% grade field way out of the floodplain that's well-drained soil, well, that's a very good place to grow food. Um, but those are kind of rare. Um, we like upland sites out of the floodplain i think that's kind of there's some big red flags that are just no go and being in a even a 500 year floodplain i think is a kind of a deal breaker um when we when we help people choose land even though there's a lot of sites like that and good that those are where the good soils are i think those are best left in the floodplain uh, processes and it's best for us to use you know the upland sites um that aren't terribly steep so that sweet spot of of being you know below the steep elevations especially in the more mountainous parts of New England where I live, but above the floodplain. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's so much there's so much else to, to that question, but those are some of the pieces of the pie. I would also encourage you to look around your site and into your neighborhood and local town and region even as much as the site itself. People tend to focus too much on the site. They say, okay, this is checking off all the boxes for, for us for the site. But but oftentimes people buy a house without even you know knocking on a neighbor's door and seeing and seeing who who lives around there. That matters a lot. Um, that affects your life a lot. Um, what's the neighborhood like? What's the town like? Really spending time kind of on those context pieces. What's up slope? Of course. What's up wind? You, you know those are good ways to find red flags. Test the water. Taste the water. Drink the water when you're looking at a house or you know if there's already a well on site like. It's amazing how many people will buy places without even drinking the water that comes out of tap. You're never going to change that water, really, the groundwater that's on site. So if you don't like it, you don't want to find out after you've signed on the dotted line kind of thing. <laughs> but there's other <laughs> things like that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, another question came in in reference to how you integrate the orchards, the medicinals, and your food. You talked about how you're handling um, squash and so forth. What are some good techniques in integrating those where they help each other? Um, there's a lot of different, I mean, there's a lot of um, companion planting, you know, that we do that that seems to have some benefits. Um, is that what the question is getting at? Like what plant guilds go well together? Or or is that, is there, is there a that, different? That as well as planting. Um, some people, based on the question they like to have their uh, very neatly planned plots or rows but from the picture we can see that it's more integrated it's more flowing so yeah. how do you create that kind of uh, of that, that how do you create that kind of situation and then yeah right speaking to the those plants the orchards and the right so uh, what's driving the, the placement mm -hmm. yeah the, the what's driving the placement of plants like on our site it makes for a lot of work, but it also makes it particularly beautiful. Um, but it's really the, the soils um, and the slope. So where it's steepest and the worst soils, we'll put perennials. Where it's lowest angle or we can make a terrace and deepen the soils, we'll put vegetables. And that ends up creating a very you know beautiful kind of English garden type of feel. Um, 
but it's also a lot more management than just like squares and rectangles and straight lines. And I'm definitely not, I wouldn't discourage anyone from making straight lines if your site allows you to do that. Um, but our site just doesn't. There's boulders sticking, I mean, there's bedrock sticking out of the ground in places that are under plants here. You can't even see, but I mean, here you can see one of the rocks actually by the pond. Um, we made a terrace out of that piece of bedrock. But our site is difficult enough that it drove kind of pockets of what we could do. Um, the other thing is the heights of plants. So of course, we always wanna plant the highest stuff north of lower things to capture the most solar, you know, most sunlight. So like we say nuts to the north, you know, put your nut trees on the north end of, of zone one or zone two. And then as, as you work south, you lower the heights of plantings are gonna be lower and lower and lower. If you need some shade in much hotter parts of the world, then that changes, but not in this part of the world. So that also drives placement a lot as well. Okay, and uh, another question that came in, uh, do you key line plow your site? We do our second site. But the first, so far, I've only showed photos of the first site. The, the, if you key line plow anywhere on this first site, it'll break a lot of different things within a very short number of feet because there's bedrock everywhere. Okay. And then uh, this last question is concerning your pond. Uh, was the pond natural or man-made? Man-made. There, almost every pond in Vermont's man-made, <laughs> but certainly <laughs> ours are. Um, yeah. And so regarding soil, this is important to mention. So this is what we started with. This, what's on the left is like, was basically an inch down everywhere, even where our gardens are. And then what's on the right is now six, eight, 10 inches down with this stuff on the left below it. But we've turned what's on the left into what's on the right through our, our perennializing and gardening, you know, lots of compost addition, lots of compost making, lots of wood chip, sheet mulching, um, but also broad forking um, and deep soil loosening and planting, getting roots in the ground. These are broad forks on the left here that are a, a favorite tool. Um, Meadow Creature makes the best one I know of. And also Rebel Garden Tools makes a really good smaller one. Um, Wilson Alvarez's outfit, he welds up some great ones. But as far as big broad forks, you can't beat the Meadow Creature, I don't think. King of spades and nice all steel spades for planting. And then for planting lots of small trees, we use these small planting bars like highballer and even better, these AM Leonard planting bars, these orange ones. They're like 30 or 40 bucks. You know, you can plant a hundred trees before lunch easily with them, you know, small bare root trees. You don't need to dig holes. So a lot of times people are a little daunted by planting hundreds of trees. We've planted thousands just on 10 acres. Um, it's really not that hard to do if you're planting little bare root trees. Mm -hmm. And Ben, one uh, quick question that just came in. What kind of nut trees are you growing? We're growing in, um, Eastern black walnut. Um, those are at the bottom of this photo. We're growing um, heart nuts, um, chestnuts, a variety of chestnuts. Um, Michigan pecan, one of those is getting really big, but that's a little bit experimental. Hickories, we're trying to push hickories and help them move north as they have been since the ice sheet left. Um, and they are moderately hardy to this, to this part of the state, but definitely not, not here already, like the Champlain Valley um, in Vermont. And we're in the county I live in, you know, you won't see a hickory unless you plant it. And even then that's quite a trick, but they're starting to take um, definitely oaks, a whole suite of oaks, all five to seven varieties of white oaks and then red oak as well which is the only oak that's really currently native in in the central part of vermont in the mountains uh, but white oak will do very well and is important an important addition for food and wildlife um those are i think most of the big nut tree uh focus focus that we have One thing I'll mention is, you know, don't don't hesitate to plant just because you are don't you don't own land. You're not on land. Um, here's my friend Dave Johnson and his um, old partner Leah, and they were planting Bearing Age apples the day that they closed on their property. 
because he didn't let it discourage him the fact that he was renting he just kept planting in pots and in the ground he just basically landscaped his rental when he went to move he started digging up his plants tens of thousands of dollars of beautiful plants his landlord said what are you doing he said well yeah you know do you want these <laughs> yeah i'll sell them to you but he you know his landlord didn't pay a dime for him and he planted them, took care of him and his landlord realized only when he was moving how valuable all of this was and he said, no, I think I want to take all these plants with me. And you can move plants really easily. Not certain nut trees, definitely not oaks, not taprooting plants, but most fruit trees, most shrubs, you just get them in the ground. You can grow up a nursery in pots and save yourself thousands of dollars. Um, so there, there's no reason not to plant perennials. Um, definitely herbaceous perennials. You can get all of, wherever you are, you can create a nursery, basically. I mean, even if you just have a balcony, you can make a bit of a plant nursery. And then that will come in huge, hugely handy when you get on a piece of land. Um, here's some more broad forking uh, view. Like on the left um, is a broad forking in action and very kind of difficult soil. And then we also sheet mulch with cardboard and that's all myceliated. All that whiteness is just wine caps, Drafari, and mycelium. We're always encouraging mycelium, just just like we are any biological process, to improve the the um, soil and the, the site as a whole. One of the main things, obviously, we're doing with water is spreading, slowing, spreading, sinking. Water wants to run straight downhill, and we have at least a 15% site a grade in most of the site, so it's rushing downhill pretty quickly, and now it's going back and forth, back and forth. What used to maybe travel about 500 feet now has to travel you know, a couple thousand feet at least um, to get off site because of all the swales and ponds and paddies and infiltration features that we've, you know, introduced into the land. Um, swales are a good example of this. You know, you have water running right down a slope. You can make very small changes to the earth. I'm not recommending this everywhere. It's definitely not applicable everywhere, but they can be very good, especially on very degraded, steeper sites, not very steep, but moderately steep. Uh, and then you're infiltrating almost all the water all of a sudden. And then you can plant on those mounds and you can graze and you can create a very um, a very lush situation very quickly that way. I'd actually usually have photos right after that of this, of, of this area right here that this is an example of, um, but I don't in this slideshow. The idea of just working on contour. I mean, don't plant your things up straight up and down slopes if possible. That's just a great way to lose soil. Um, you do have to worry about drainage in certain situations, but we're a big fan of being on contour and mounding up where possible. Um, here's an example of during Hurricane Irene, which is a major flood in our part of the world. And this is the same at the same moment. So the river the bottom settling pond is getting hundreds of gallons a minute right now after about five inches of rain in Hurricane Irene. So I'll narrate it because I don't know how well you hear my audio, but um, we were producing and, and yielding perfectly clear water on, on a steep slope. And we were taking in 25 acres above us onto our 10 acres and only releasing perfectly clear water with no silt. And yet the river was obviously moving, you know, thousands of dump truck loads of silt a minute um, of, of precious soil out of our valley to Lake Champlain, where it's just basically filling up the lake slowly. And um, we're infiltrating it all and 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 um, clarifying any silty water that's coming onto our site. And so that was a really neat. This was in 2011, or whenever it was, when Hurricane Irene was. This is a great example of of ecosystem restoration at work in a very acute event. You can see this is uh, probably about 10 gallons a minute leaving our site totally clear. This is the bottom outlet of our property where only in major events water leaves the site. Our goal is to hold all the water, um, but in a major, we got six inches in 12 hours, water was leaving, but perfectly clear. And then as soon as it hits the local, the nearest road ditch, it's picking up silt and a degrading um, situation from there on out. And none of the soil is uh, being retained until Lake Champlain where it settles out. Um, probably some of it even is making it to the ocean in, a, in an event like this. We do a lot with spring development, especially on our second site. 
um, on our first site, this is a good example of the recreational benefit of the ponds. This is the middle pond. So, you know, a lot of benefits besides eco ecosystem restoration. Um, then, um, of some of the building process uh, that we've done on site, logging, you know, using a lot of site based materials to build with, making terraces, you know, portable mill work, friends and family raising uh, buildings heating with wood, um, getting a lot of functions out of wood cook stoves. That's a big, big thing that we focus on. All of this is in my book and, and then a whole bunch else. If you haven't seen it, I think Anne mentioned it. Um, this is the most important piece of technology on our site, besides for the, you know, the roof above our head, I would say. Um, cooks, heats the whole place, heats hot water, um, firelight, bakes, very, very productive and, and resilient um, system here. Makes maple syrup, <laughs> germinate seeds. You know, there's a long list. I keep meaning to write them all down of dries, herbs, and cloves, and mushrooms, and everything else. Um, this drying system works out really great. It has swinging in on a, on threaded rod metal bars, so you, you have a very easy way to dry here. Then Any other, it food. makes hot water, which is incredibly valuable, and we put a lot of energy into hot water in this part of the world, and this this mm -hmm. does it on uh, as a matter of course of heating your home. There were a few Any more other questions. questions, or should yes, I keep rolling? Were. No, there are a few more questions that came in. I was just waiting for a good point to to interject these. You there? Um, you mentioned very briefly about the about zone one, and could you talk a little bit more? about the zones that are in your area or just, or how to de determine those zones in general. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I had my audio muted because, uh, or I had my, my, yeah, my audio turned down because I didn't want to uh, hear the video that was playing. No, I, I can hear you, I can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> right. I, yeah, any questions or should I keep rolling? There were two questions that came in. One concerning zones. Uh, you mentioned uh, parts of your property being in a zone one. How are those zones determined? And is that something that folks can do on their property? Yeah, when I say zone one, I'm, I'm talking the permaculture zone. So zone one through five, one being where you spend most of your time, two less so, five unmanaged places that you might go visit, but you don't do anything. So that's the classic permaculture zones. Definitely check them out if you're not familiar with them. They're a very, very helpful way of planning on any site. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Uh, and the zones at, on your property, um, how are those uh, set up and what, what are in those zones? So five being your unmanaged all the way sure. to one that's yeah. closest to you. Yeah, so, you know, veggie gardens are all in zone one, um, greenhouse is zone one, wood shops, general shop is zone one. Um, I mean, there's even kind of, you could say a zone 0.5 where like salad, sal a bed, you know, a few raised beds right by a kitchen would be where you're going really often. I mean, there's zones within veggie gardens like garlic, squash, potatoes, those take a lot less care. You have to visit them a lot less often than your herb beds, than your salad greens, that kind of thing. So you want to have them more accessible. All other things being equal, there are other variables which may force that not to be the case, but the best setup is gonna be what you need to tend to most is closest at hand. Um, and that's you know critical site layout criteria um, and, and framework and guidelines. Um, so that's a good example of kind of what's in zone one, zone two, you know, you might rotate chickens through zone one and two. We, when we had sheep, which we don't right now, um, they would be in zone one a little bit, but mostly in zone two and three, you know, visiting, let's say once a day. Um, a lot of the firewood work I do is in zone three and four, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When we have one pond in zone one, um, a lot of like orchard and, and larger like nut trees are zone three, four, but fruit trees, shrub, berries tend to be zone one to two to three. 
Yeah, so that's the, that's a bit of the gradient of of of, of the zone, zonation and kind of what's in it for us. And it, they're laid out as they are according to access and also time. I mean, the more time you have, if you're a full time homesteader, your zone one's going to be bigger than if you have to commute to work every day somewhere off site. Um, the goal is really to have zone one be as big as possible because zone one is by far the most productive place. Um, so as you improve in skills and or have more time to dedicate your zone one would grow over time but then as you get older and you know less able physically your zone one's going to shrink down as well um you know there's a there's a human life cycle to it as well i mean i think i've reached my peak zone one you know and now things are going to be shrinking a little because i don't quite have maybe all the energy I had five years ago, I also have a child, so that, that shrinks zone one. <laughs> um, other needs in life can shrink it. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a tip of the iceberg on the, on the zone piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question on irrigation and, and water, what were some of your challenges in terms of setting up your irrigation system just based on the tables and um, well, we don't we don't really have that. an irrigation system, um, especially on our first site, because we have very heavy soils and a lot of water right below the surface. So we're very fortunate in that we almost never water. We water some beds, you know, when we sow seeds, I'll just dunk the watering can in the pond and water seeds in. I rarely run a hose. Um, so the most irrigation we do is set up a sprinkler in the nursery because the pots dry out quickly. Um, and that comes off our well. Um, we do have a spring, which we tap into a little bit for drinking and, and if it keeps a pond full, but um, we harvest rainwater into one of the ponds, uh, but we don't have an irrigation system per se. We have, we have challenges from our heavy wet soil, clay soil, but it also has its benefits. Mm -hmm. And you may be getting to this in the next segment, but how you weave in or work in livestock, meaning chickens or goats or ducks and so forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I can talk about it right here. I mean, we grazed um, a whole bunch of Icelandic sheep through systems. I mean, they can, you can definitely, depending on the animal, especially chickens and, and, and we did a lot with ducks and geese they can move through zone one and two if you fence off your veggie gardens and what we chose to do is fence our gardens and and not our poultry it was we would always free range poultry um we'd have to fence our sheep for various obvious reasons and less obvious reasons but um they could be moved through zone two and three in you know tree and shrub based systems like you see them here amid, amid hazelnuts and sea berry um and they they could get along with you know, our, our more established perennials, definitely not baby perennials, the sheep would take out, um, like woody perennials, but um, goats are much more challenging. You know, they're on the far end of the gradient because they're kind of the opposite of a tree. You know, like if, you, if you're trying to cultivate trees, goats are generally going to be a major challenge um, and, and have a serious fencing need. So those can be the hardest. Um, animals to integrate into like a, a system where you're trying to have woody plants as part of your crops um chickens and and ducks and geese can be some of the easiest um so we we've you know we would always rotate with electronet um our sheep that was our methods our, our tools we used um chickens were free range and we fenced them out of the garden and ducks were free range. We had ducks more than anything. And those we could keep out of our garden with 18 inch high fencing, metal fencing. And that was, you know, really handy because it was easy to set up. It was cheap, just rolls, 50 to 100 foot rolls of 18 inch high, you know, um, galvanized two by four fencing. And they would generally respect that. Um, and they would, you could get them in the habit of circulating through the paths of the site in zone one and two. Um, geese have their own challenges and they will take out your veggie garden if they can get in there, um, but they really, really will consume a lot of grass, unlike chickens or, or ducks. Um, I mean, it's funny, people talk about pasture poultry all the time, but the only, past, the only poultry that actually eats pasture in any real way is, are geese. Chickens aren't an aren't a grass-eating animal. I mean, they'll pick out bugs, but they're not 
an herbivore. You know, they're not they're not a grazer. They're not a ruminant. Sheep and 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 geese will actually and and goats and any ruminant uh, caprines and and cows and horses can actually you know live on grass. And so that's a good thing. Um, chickens, you need some kind of input. You know, it's hard to get around grain with chickens, and we definitely want to get around buying grain. So chickens were difficult. I mean, you needed food scraps to do that, and you need a lot of them, depending on how many chickens you have. So chickens and pigs tend to be the most grain um, hungry animal and hard to get around the grain input for, I think is safe to say. Now, again, unless you have some feedstock of like restaurant waste or brewery waste or um, you know dairy waste or whatever it might be that you can put in as feedstock to, to those animals. Um, mostly we want to be grass-based and tree-based as far as fueling the system. So those are going to be geese and um, especially ruminant grazing animals. And the smaller the ruminants are, I mean, the smaller the grazing animals within reason are, the better because they're, they can reach up and damage less, you know, established trees that are getting above them. These are just other shots of, of our rice production, which we did for a handful of years. We don't do any longer. It's just our season is so short that rice poses a lot of challenges, but we did figure out how to do it. And, and it was a very, we learned a lot by, by doing it. And we still have the patties, which are beneficial to the watershed as a whole. See, ben, this guy got question. in our veggie garden. What's that? Oh, one more question, Ben, um, yeah. concerning, um, animals you mentioned having bees mm -hmm. and where are those bees in terms of the, uh, the the zone system you have and uh do you rotate them do you keep them stationary i i don't move the bees no the bees are hard to move um they get quite heavy the hives and and they don't like to be moved and um we don't need to move them for pollination services so so they're really I try to set them up where I would never want to move them where they have very good win winter windbreak um, and are pretty close. I put them in zone one. Most people put Z B zone uh, bees like out in pretty far from where they spend time. I like to, to keep track of them um, and be near them. That does pose a, a stinging hazard. Um, you don't want to be too close, but I like to keep the bears away. So zone one, they're less likely to go bears. I do fence them, hot fence them for sure, and hard fence them on our second site, as well as hot fence. But um, yeah, we just put them in a very kind of protected, wind protected area, um, and we don't we don't move them. I have some photos of the bees and can talk about them if people want. We do a lot of grafting of existing trees. So we have like a lot of Crataegus, Hawthorn. You can graft pear right onto Hawthorn. That's a great way of turning a Hawthorn into a pear above deer brows or animal brows height. We at times have done a lot with mushroom production. Um, it's a great way to have educational projects because it's easy to, to put a lot of hands on a mushroom project. We still run a nursery. I sell plants. Um, more than I, more than I should. It's a lot of work. I keep. I like making plants mostly for my own purposes, but then I have a lot to to sell and trade. Um, wine caps trafari have been very easy mushroom to get, although very perishable, quickly perishable. Sometimes we've grown oysters on logs. I don't focus on that much anymore. I try to um, I try to wild harvest as much more more every year. Um, honey has been a has been a big focus and bees as a whole. Um, I have some photos of them near the end. Here's some of our terraced gardens right here. Uh, a big fan of raised beds and lining gardens with wood, like defining edges of beds. It keeps weeding way down. Um, garlic, I like to say if you can't grow garlic, then you might want to not try veggie gardening. <laughs> it's a good gateway into it for people. I don't know who the audience is here. Probably maybe many of you know this, but if you're just stepping into this world, you know, start with garlic and, and 
that's a very easy crop and very forgiving. Garlic and potatoes, and, and if that doesn't work out, maybe maybe there's other things that you want to focus on instead. <laughs> um, they're pretty easy crops and good ways to get into things. And high value as well. And the same with salad. You know, you can easily grow hundreds of dollars worth of herbs and salad mix. And so that's a very low, low hanging fruit, no pun intended, way into, you know, eating some food off your land. Um, yeah, we, we're we pulling back with how much garlic we've been growing because we every year we have more than we need. This time of year, it's, you know, kind of gone by. I can talk about heating systems a little bit um, and fuel systems if people want. Um, but any other questions at this point? Uh, before you move into uh, fuel systems, um, gosh, there was a question that came in um, going back to your food stores or the amount of food that comes from your site. How much would you say that is food that you all live off of for the year? About what's the percentage, even if it's a guesstimate? Well, I'd say, you know, uh, depending on the year, and every year is very different, depending on the season and how easy it is and pests, and, you know, in the veggie garden. Often I've grown between 50 and 85% to 90% of the calories that I need um, on the land. But that doesn't mean that I've that 50 to 85, let's say, percent of my calories has come from the land because food goes bad in the root cellar. Um, I trade or give away some food. Some food even sometimes doesn't make it in into being processed. So that, but as far as if I had more time to process or or didn't go out to eat or go to friends' houses for dinner and things like that, you know, and I really wanted to to make sure every one of those calories that was grown outside was was consumed or needed to, you could say it's like 50 in some years to 85% in a, in a bigger year. Um, in the last couple of years, I have a child, so that number's not gone up for sure. <laughs> it's definitely, you know, we'll see this year, but last year was, was a lot of time, you know, went into raising him. So that means less for the land. Um, and veggie gardens are a big part of our calorie intake, you know, cabbages, kohlrabi, potatoes, squash. Um, we are now growing wild rice in earnest, so that could that could really comprise some calories because that's that's a staple. Um, and you know, but a lot of like the fruits and nuts aren't a big part of the calorie input. Um, and that's important to mention. You know, we, we're always trying to learn ways that they can be, um, but they're more like nutrient input than caloric input. And that's important, just as important. It's probably harder to be nourished than to be fed in some ways. Uh, but, you know, they're both important. And I know you're going to be moving into this portion, um, but there was a question about your energy or heating. I know mm -hmm. you showed the other uh, wood stoves, but what are the, uh, the different types of woods that you're using to heat your home? Is there any solarization of solar products that are being used to keep it warm? Um, and then how do you make that switch over as you go into the warmer months? Yeah, so I'll scroll back to the firewood system. So we're pretty cold, probably colder than most if you're in Massachusetts, unless you're in Roe or Heath. Even then, you're probably a little warmer than we are, but those those areas are pretty cold. And the rest of the state's much milder than we are here in the mountains of Vermont. We'll get, you know, 20 below to 25 below most winters. Um, sometimes it won't get above freezing for one time was three months. Um, a few winters ago, the average temperature was two degrees in January. So it's quite harsh compared to most of New England um, and definitely most of the country. Um, so we have a high need for fuel wood and we grow a lot of black locusts. This is 50 black locusts at, at, at bare root when we plant them. We've planted thousands of them across both of our sites. Great fuel wood. These are just three year old and hedges that you see here. You can eat the flowers and do a lot with these plants, but they make a great, um, so here, here's a hedge of them again in, let's say this is probably year five or six, great fodder for sheep. 
We are just starting to harvest them for fuel wood about 10 to 12 years in now. But we still log a lot of red maple and birch and stuff that we're trying to discourage and, and change into things like black locust and oaks right now. So we're still in that part of the phase of harvesting what's existing on the property, low value stuff, burning that and transitioning the forest parts of the properties into higher value hardwoods like oak and um, black locust, as far as firewood goes. Black locust is, is our kind of fuel wood crop, you could say, that we plant for deliberately for fuel wood and fence posts and other uses as well, but mainly fuel wood. There's no way to make more more calories as quickly, I don't think, in this climate than than through black locust because it's as fast growing as a willow or an alder, but it's as dense as white oak. So it's just a anomaly as far as trees go. It's just a carbon lignification machine that's just way more putting on way more carbon than any other tree as far as i know in this part of the world osage orange might be similar in a much warmer climate than we are but we also have a very efficient little studio apartment home that can heat basically on a quart or two including all hot water um, and even the existing house we've renovated we've kind of improved a lot and we've We've closed different areas off and made it so we can heat on a couple cords pretty easily. But a lot of a lot of homes in New England, if they're just going to heat on wood, will require three, four, five, six cords, and that's without hot water. Um, we also have solar hot water, which is a great combination with wood, because once essentially we just slow down on the wood burning, the space heating need, the solar, the sun's coming out. April, basically to late October is pretty good solar hot water making season. And as we're looking at these beautiful pictures of uh, the food that's been harvested, do you have a food preservation system that you utilize? Um, uh, yeah, a few a few different methods of preserving. We, you know, we'll sterile can, as you can see here, but we don't do much sterile canning. I don't like to do it. I don't like canned food as much as drying, dehydrating, and especially lacto-fermenting. So we'll lacto-ferment, you know, pretty much almost anything, especially as far as vegetables go, pickling, um, drying, you know, root cellaring for sure. Is our biggest one is probably root cellaring as far as um, cal caloric, putting up calories goes. Um, we also do use the deep freezer quite a bit. We have a couple freezers and, you know, we'll freeze a lot of meat and, um, and fruit and like fruit juice um, and pestos and things like that. Um, but we do lacto ferment quite heavily big fan of kohlrabi in the last handful of years it's kind of replacing our cabbage um cabbage used to be like the probably our biggest caloric vegetable input besides squash and now kohlrabi and squash are probably pretty much at the top of the list carrots too um i always try to grow more carrots and potatoes those are those are up there But we're looking at just a whole bunch of different fruits here. This is the second site where we have planted 10,000 trees or so starting six years ago. Um, and then this is what it's looking like more recently. Um, things are at six to nine feet tall, our, our hedgerow, agroforestry hedgerows. We graze between the hedgerows. Um, and then some shots with the bees. I do a naturally drawn comb set up for the bees where I'm not I'm moving away I've moved away completely from buying foundation uh, because of the miticide residues and also the natural cell size issues um, and I make kind of all my own bee boxes and, and use a ware quilt for insulation on the tops um, and are just really trying to focus on a bee centric beekeeping approach um, you can see there's no foundation in this in this frame, the no bot foundation. We're letting the bees draw all the foundation themselves. Um, and we have, we've planted, you know, thousands upon thousands of flowers that are 
not necessarily weren't necessarily for the bees you know when we planted them although more recently that's the idea but we realized over time that you know all of these things are pretty much anything we're planting is, is a great nectar source um we probably have five thousand comfrey plants in the ground and that's an ongoing nectar source especially when we chop and drop it and kind of cut it throughout the season so you get a rolling nectar source that's continuous um this is just some some of the season you know honey as it goes along this is our our bee product we sell whole comb honey i don't really like to to process it and um extract it because i think the best in whole comb form is as good as it gets it doesn't i don't think i don't think it's any you can't you can't make it any better than that so we we sell whole comb honey so ben as we are beginning to wrap up and come to the end of our uh webinar and i tell yeah. you you are doing such amazing work and um Thanks. i'd like or if you could uh, in your closing comments, kind of talk about some of the things, some of your wins, some of the um, uh, the challenges, which you've gone over a little bit, but just some of the benefits of creating uh, the sites, your two sites like you have, and how it's benefited you and your family. Um, yeah, well, it's it's just been a, um, a, a vitalizing process. I mean, I'll, I'll pull back to a photo that I think um is indicative of that um i mean health personal health has been a big one um good work to have to do has been a big one saving money has been a big one Get, getting better food than we can buy and and medicine has been a huge one uh learning livelihood i mean my, a big part of my livelihood is helping other people set these systems up and so it's all a process of experimentation and figuring out how to inhabit a piece of land um, that had no food systems on it. Um, I don't know, there's there's many, many benefits. Um, and, you know, there's downsides too. It takes a lot of time. It's a big commitment. Um, I don't have the freedom and haven't had the freedom over the years that some of my friends have who don't have big gardens and, you know, homesteads. I mean, you give up a lot. Um, it's, it's, both ends are incalculable you know i think i i've gained incalculably you know beyond what i can um assess and i've also lost probably on the other end uh certain things beyond that which i can uh, assess probably you know relationship wise to people who who aren't where i live because it's it's a big commitment and uh, if you know any farmers, especially animal farmers, you know, you know, they're not just going to come over randomly and visit you <laughs> because they're really, really busy. And they have a lot of babies they're caring for, basically. Um, you know, all of these plants, like all the plants are your children, essentially. I mean, they need your care to some extent. So so you can think of it like having a lot of a, a lot of children you're taking care of. Um, you know, they're not obviously as involved as a human child, but. You know, you have a lot more of them than human kids. So um, it, it's a, at this the scale we've done it. It's a big commitment. Um, we've also pulled back from it as we're raising a, a human baby. <laughs> we've had to. So um, we're we're happy for the perennials now that are just producing with no care and that those are in the ground because the veggie garden's not going to do much unless we're every year putting a lot into it. Well, I tell you, it's it's an amazing thing to be able to, to make that kind of sacrifice. It sounds like it uh, has been a true benefit. And I can say, and, and hopefully the viewers and listeners have gotten the same thing, uh, a sense of encouragement and inspiration from what you're doing. So we do thank you for sharing that with us. And for those who have, may not have heard of Ben's book, uh, it's called The Resilient Farm and Homestead. It's a great book, an easy read. You can uh, order it from Chelsea Green. Um, I, I encourage everyone to, to pick up that book. And I know um, once reading it, I've been able to kind of institute some things in my own growing and with some of the gardens I work with here in Springfield. Um, 
as well. Ben, do you do classes or do any kind of instruction during the year? Yeah, so I just pulled up some photos. So this is our from our permaculture courses. When we do a, a permaculture course, a 10-day course, which just focuses on what we do and how to do this and the principles and processes behind it um, wherever you live. Um, so yeah, check out our, our website has a lot of info uh, where it, wholesystemsdesign.com. Okay. All right, please, please go yeah. to the website and see what's coming up. Um, this uh, webinar will be up on NOFA's uh, YouTube page and archive page uh, by the end of the week. And if you are interested in getting a link um, as soon as we release it, you can give me an email um, or give me, uh, email me at Anna at nofamass.org and we'll get this to you. But again, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, this has been a wealth of information and very enjoyable as we are in the midst of our growing season. And I hope that uh, things continue to go well for you as well for all of our other viewers that are here Thanks with us. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to be with us. And we look forward to seeing you next month where we'll be talking about grazing, responsible grazing with Sarah Flack. Uh, so it's good to hear about some of your uh, grazing and how you're handling livestock in your situation, Ben. It was very nice to hear about that. So next month yeah. on July 24th, which is a Wednesday night, we'll hear from Sarah Flack. We'll be talking about responsible grazing as it relates to soil fertility. So you want to tune in for that. Bring a friend, tell a friend, and don't forget about NOFA Summer Conference. August 10th and 11th at Hampshire College. We're going back home to Hampshire College. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Have a great night. I hope the sun has come out in your area and may the season go continue to go well for you all. Good night. Have a good night.